Hey, what's happening? Thank you for tuning in. Really appreciate it. I uh, hope you are doing great in your life. This is Matt Javitt, half of the travel couple that is now back in the States after 800 days of traveling the world. We are getting into a good flow now and um, life is good. Today, I did an interview with, uh, his name is Shane. He is a future world traveler. Him and his wife have some plans and dreams and goals of doing something similar to what Nikki and I did. I think his plan sounds like they want to do it for about a year, maybe longer. But this is part one of a three-part conversation where Shane and I just dig into his questions. We got introduced through a mutual friend. Shane heard about our story through him. And then he sent me a note and said, hey, can we talk? And we talked for a little bit. And then I thought some of his questions were excellent. So I wanted to put them out there in case other people were having the same types of questions regarding long-term travel. And I uh, just want to dig into the details because we'd love to help people in this way. Those that are dreaming to do something like we did, I'd love to be that part of your plan and help you in any way. So that's what we, my hope was, is just by documenting our conversation, it can answer a few questions and maybe lead to more questions that you might have. Okay. So we'll get into that in a second. If you're just getting caught up to speed, again, Nikki and I traveled to 35 countries in about 27 months from February of 2017 to May of 2019. And this podcast is part of that documentation. Um, we did about 60 episodes from the road as we were traveling. And now that we're back, we want to continue to talk about, keep the travel conversation open. Um, we love travel. And the hope is, is through our experiences and through the things that we see in research and all the things that we went through to continue to share in a positive way around weekend for help you with your weekend getaway, your week long vacation, or if you're planning like Shane is planning to do something long term, maybe we can give you some tips there as well. You can always check up on our journey and the things we went to at passportjoy.com. There we list out all the, a few of the journeys so far tab, list out all the countries and the places that we visited to make it easy for you to, to find that destination. If you're only here to find that one place, if you're just saying, hey, we're just trying to go to Peru and see Machu Picchu, or if you're thinking about the Galapagos Islands or thinking about going down to South Africa, it's easy to go on the website, either just use the search engine or the little search bar I got in there or go to the journey so far tab and you can check all that out. Um, a few things, if you can, to help support us. Again, Nikki's book is on Amazon. It's called Passport Joy, Reflections on Life, Love, and Other Stuff While Traveling the World. My YouTube series, I just shot another video down in Lexington, Kentucky, and that will be airing soon. The series is called World Barber Shop Adventures. It continues to gain traction, and it's, it's uh, been exciting, so check that out on YouTube. Either go under find Matt Javitt or look for World Barber Shop Adventures, and it should pop up. And another great way to support us is our partners page. People reach out all the time and say, hey, Matt, appreciate the advice, love the stuff, and then at some point they want to use some of the stuff that we're talking about, whether it's trusted house sitters or sky scanner or seven corners insurance. The best way to, to help us is by going to our partners page and just clicking through those links and purchasing whatever you plan on purchasing anyway. Uh, those are affiliate links. We get a little kickback on that. It's cents and dollars. It's not a ton of money, but it's, it's just a cool way to help pay for this podcast because this stuff isn't free. And so if you want to help us in any way, that is a great way to help us. And we really appreciate that. As always, you hear it from probably if you if you listen to more than one podcast, you hear it all the time, subscribe, rate, and review. This is absolutely the best way to help us. The subscriptions just means that you get it in your inbox every time you listen, everything, every time we finish an episode, it pops right up for you. And that's a great way to just to continue to I guess that had that loyal listener um, ship and, and we appreciate that. The ratings and review help a ton as well for those that don't know about our story and they go to the engine, they try to, they're trying to search for something. Those ratings and reviews really help us get in front of new travel listeners and we greatly appreciate that. I got a, um, it was actually an Instagram message, which we love. We love all the feedback that we can, whether it's Instagram, YouTube, emails, we love it all. And it, the, the, it's funny because now that the World Barbershop series is is taking off a little bit, the more things grow, the more negative that you hear, right? It's kind of like just how things work in our current world. And um, to get the negative comments on YouTube is almost comical in a way that people take so much time just to talk trash. 
So it feels better when you see something positive and the positives absolutely outweigh the negatives. But um, when people are just like, just throwing track, like, like all I'm trying to do is travel and document and just give back and like give in this, in the YouTube series is more about like give a visual aspect of the awesome cultures we're experiencing. And then my time in barbershops and stuff like that. So for people to like take time to say like, dude, your music isn't cool or whatever they're trying to just talk trash about. It's funny, but at the same time, it's not like how sad do these cats have to be to sit behind their desk and like watch a video of me. And then like the fact that like I'm spending money to put this stuff out there and they still want to just talk trash. It's nuts. So whenever we hear positive or we see positive me- messages come through, man, I love it. And I'm, I'm so appreciative for people to take the time. I got one the other day from Liz who uh, her and her husband are planning on a Southeast Asia trip. And based on they're listening to our podcast and they're just basically saying our podcasts have helped them prepare for their first big trip. And they really wanted to um, just to thank us and give us a shout out for the great content, stuff like that. Thank you. And you know what I mean? I just, I, I'm really appreciative of all that stuff because it's the, these negative losers out there that just, uh, they try to derail my positivity to what we're trying to do here. And that's basically just give back it's because travel has changed us so much that we want other people to experience it and live it and love it like we did. All right. And if you want a weekly email, it's not as much weekly as I like it to be, but it's almost consistently weekly on Thursdays. I've scheduled back a little bit, but if you want to get that, go to passportjoy.com. You'll see the little box to put in your email address, put in there, hit go. It comes out on Thursdays, but almost once a week, sometimes two or three times a month. And I just give some travel insight tips, things I'm going through, hacks that if I can find them out there and I like to share them with you, um, that's what you'll get in your inbox through the newsletter. All right. Again, I hope you enjoy this episode. It's part one of three. It's a pretty good conversation with shame. Thanks. We are um, going to have a conversation today with a friend, uh, now a friend, his name is Shane Conti. We were introduced by a mutual contact out of Ohio that heard Nikki and I's story of travel, let Shane know the story to him and his wife. And then through that, that conversation with them, they reached out to us for potential guidance and just more communication on what we went through and some of our learning during our 27 months on the road. So as you know, Nikki and I are very open to sharing our advice and our experiences to other people, especially those that are looking to do something as far as long-term travel or have goals or dreams of of seeing the world in some capacity. So I was open to it. Uh, Shane and I connected. We had about a 30-minute conversation, but it was very broken because Nikki and I were traveling through the hills in mountains of West Virginia during one of our Midwest adventures out to Pennsylvania. So I thought uh, in talking to Shane, it'd be a great idea to have this conversation and record it so we can answer some questions for other listeners that might be thinking of similar questions, but haven't written in or, or haven't had a chance to reach out to have us answer these questions and just have this uh, cool conversation on where Shane's coming from and his thought process because they're hoping and they're planning to do something similar to what we did on some sort of scale. And then just just kind of walk through the things that are of interest to him and his wife and then uh, fill in any blanks as we can. Okay. Hey, Shane, how you doing? Good. Thanks. Wonderful. So Nikki and I set out on our journey. We left in February, 2017 and we started planning, I guess we had the travel bug. It was in us deep and we wanted to do something and it had always been a dream of ours in about March of 2016. So about 11 months prior, we started the process of, okay, we can do this. And we started searching like crazy to figure out answers. And then through those next 11 months, there was peaks and valleys of how much work we were doing to get prepared to make the transition to travel for 27 months. So I guess if you can, can you let the listeners know where you're at? Is it hopeful or is it something you guys are absolutely going to do? And then I guess at a very high level, what are your, what are your hopes to get out of your journey? So uh, we both, you know, before we even met each other and since we were younger, we both always wanted to travel. And that's always been a, a bug for us is to get out, see new places, to escape a small town. And so then that's always been, I think, in us from a long time. But then, you know, to go from that to 
basically we've been lucky enough to take some really nice vacations. But vacations, whenever we'd come back from a vacation, we'd always want to keep going. And so then we'd have some time in between there where we'd adjust back to, I guess, normal life. And then immediately we'd start planning our next trip. And, you know, there's a difference, I think, in our minds between a vacation and travel, whereas travel to me and us is learning about cultures, experiencing things, having experiences versus vacation is more escaping a life and taking a break from a life and maybe some downtime, which I think you need, but there's always been a difference there for us. So as we took more and more vacations, when we we started talking about, hey, do we want to try doing longer term travel and then going into changing our lives to really what you have to do, I think, to accomplish that for more longer term travel. So that's kind of where we're at now is We've made the decision where we both want to do this, and now it trying to put all the ducks in a row and getting things into place is really you know a challenge right now, and you have to stay focused on doing that to get to that point where you can actually leave. You know, so yeah, so that that's my first thing is we're selling items. You know, we we have vehicles, and you know, there's there's a lot of routes when you set down routes. There's a lot of things that you have to, I think take care of before you can just leave Uh, in in our position. I'm not saying everyone, you know, the less responsibility, the less things you have, it's, it's easier. But in our position, you know, we do have some things that we have to take care of before we can go for a longer, you know, we can go for two weeks. We've gone for a month before, but to go for a year, which is we're planning on going for at least a year, if not, three years. But we understand though, as as you get further on, so many unknowns are out there that we'd like to go for as long as we can is essentially our goal and our hope. But you know, you just have to play it by ear. But planning for the longer term travel is really the uh the goal right now. That's awesome. And that's uh, like like you said, it's there's differences with everybody. Nick and I in, in our conversations with with the two of us, we understand that we didn't have as many when it comes to like a, a, a bigger house and a farm and some of the things you might be dealing with. We have a smaller condo in Indianapolis, but we had corporate jobs where you're self-employed. So everybody's going to have kind of their own balance of, okay, what, what are the things we have to tie up and transition from? And some people potentially could have jobs that they continue to do remotely, right? So yeah. there's, uh, there's everybody has a different balance of what they're trying to what they're trying to get I guess to be able to move from and transition into that life on the road. So uh, it's there's not one cookie cutter. Hey, this is how you do it, but it's more of the balance of how, okay, how do we leave all these things in the proper way so we can make the trip as I guess as risk free and as pressure free and stress free as possible, right? Yeah, that's kind of I, I definitely agree that that's you know the ultimate goal is. I think there's a, an instinct to want to plan and you know plan for everything that possibly can happen, but there's also an awareness the more you get into this that you're not going to be able to do that. There's going to be things out there that are going to happen, and you read stories and listen to stories from everyone from you to other people that well, we were going to go do this, but something happened, so we had to adjust on the road and, and you know we're aware of that. So the thing is tying up our things here whatever it may be, our job or our assets or our responsibilities, because yeah, I agree with you that everyone's different there. And it's just making sure those things are not going to come up later on and go, oh, we have to cut everything short because you know of an issue back home. That's kind of our concern now is how do we get that stuff tied up? But at the same time, the fun part, I think, has always been for us is looking at places and where do we want to go and trying to decide that aspect of it too, at the same time saying, where do we want to go first? Why do we want to go there? The logistics of a one-way ticket. I mean, that's my first question. Like, did you buy a one-way ticket when you started? Yeah. So it's, uh, I guess it's, it's funny in a, in a way. Um, when we decided, uh, so we came home from a big trip in March of 16 and At that point, it was evident to me that we have to go do this because it it had been deep inside us for a couple of years at least. 
Um, but we had always been pushing off saying we don't have enough money yet. And we were at that point where, okay, we can go do this. But I knew it wasn't going to be like, hey, we can leave in two months. It was always going to be, we're going to do this within the next year. And so when we came back in March of 2016, I, I knew that was the case. I felt like the opportunity was then because we both had this deep sense that it's going to become a reality. So that April of 2016, I booked a one-way using airline points. Mm-hmm. I booked a one-way flight from Indianapolis to Santiago, Chile. In Santiago, Chile, I, I knew that we wanted to start in South America for a lot of reasons. Spanish-speaking country, um, it would be warm during that time. And our entire plan was always to stay in warm weather because we knew we were only going to take the one backpack each. And we knew that we couldn't take a lot of winter types of clothes. And we're just, we're beachy, summer, get in, we like coastlines. We're, we're, those are the type of travelers we are. We like to, in the, to be in those locations. So I knew we were going to be in South America. We had traveled before to Brazil and Argentina, so I knew I wanted to focus on the West Coast. So I looked up and down the West Coast to see where our points would go the furthest, and it just happened to be Santiago, Chile, when I booked it. So that's how that's how we booked the first one way ticket in April of 2016 for the flight to leave in February of 2017. And then with the idea too, it was ten months out. We could always back out. You know what I mean? I mean, there's, there was nothing fully committed us to, to travel. We had things going on in our lives with our careers and everything. We could always step back. But for me, that was the first step of showing that we're committed. And then I booked a second flight in June of 2016, three months, about three months, two and a half, three months later, I booked a second flight that took us from Ecuador to Portugal, again, using airline points. So I used... Uh, I got us. I knew we were going to be in South America. I knew I wanted to be in the summer in Europe. So that took us out of Ecuador, out of South America in early June to Portugal in Europe. So that was, that's how we started. So you kind of said, okay, we're going to go to Chile and then you have to make it to the next, where your next flight was leaving. Was that kind of a goal is, okay, we have this much time to get from Santiago to here to get to our next flight to Europe. You know, yeah, I knew. Yeah, I knew that we wanted to spend about three and a half or four months in South America. So that's what I, I knew that because um, our flight left out of Guayaquil, Ecuador. I knew that we would travel in between there because for us, we made like a, a high level bucket list where I knew Machu Picchu was on the list. Mm-hmm. I knew we were going to travel down to the south of Chile, and I knew that Galapagos Islands was on the list. So based on those three things on the west coast of South America, I knew that we were going to go over those three and a half, four months. I knew we were going to visit all those locations. So now it was just going to be up to me as we got closer to our point of leaving America. I knew that I'd have to begin to coordinate what those three and a half, four months look like. But from there, I knew we would go to Europe after that. So for me, it was more of set up the big pieces of the puzzle. Then later I booked a trip from Rome to India because I knew we were going to spend two months in India. So for me, I was just piecing together the next year of travel from the okay. different continents. And that, and that is, is the easiest way to explain it. And then from there, once we got to the locations, I always wanted to be a little bit flexible, but know that we could save money if we planned some. Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the money is, is always a, uh, you know, that's a concern for everyone from regardless of the level of travel, if it's hostels and one star to five star, you know, to me, we're always floating in between depending what we can stay at one or the other. And, you know, we're open to that, but it's always about, you know, there's a budget there that we're trying, like you, you said, you use miles, which we use miles you know, pretty effectively too. And there's points and all that. And so, you know, that's interesting to me that you'll book those almost bullet points and then fill in the dots later. Were you ever booking anything while you were on the road? I mean, you know what I mean? Like from your phone or from a laptop somewhere in a country and you're like, and you were saying, okay, well, we have two months in India, but once you landed in India, did you have a an Airbnb or some third place to stay or, you know, what, what's the time frame for booking those a week in advance, a month in advance, stuff like that. How do you think about that? Yeah. So it, it varied throughout. So absolutely. We, we booked constantly on the road and that was 
a great deal of our time while we traveled, logistics is huge and how hoping to minimize that time as much as possible. But like you said, it's almost the fun part of it, that research process of getting to see the next location. And then maybe you're deciding where at in some of those locations to go. So that's a fun process as well. I'm really big on the dreaming aspect of travel on you do your research, you're thinking about it, you're dreaming about it, you're visualizing yourself in these locations, and then you figure out which one's the best for you. So we always attempted to be two or three months ahead of our our journey. But when it made sense for some of the bigger stuff, some of the longer flights, just to have that security to know, like towards the end, to know that we were leaving out of Bangkok to get to Australia. And then we knew the the Australia to Fiji flight. So we wanted to get those big pieces and some of those longer flights in order because then we, the, the most of the research could be spent on accommodations. Or if we had to spend time on finding small local flights, like when you talked about India, um, we spent two months in India, but we had to fly from Delhi to Hyderabad. And then how did we get from Hyderabad to Nagpur? It ended up being a train. And then how did we get from, it was Bhopal to Kerala? That was a flight. So to, to be able to do all those different transportation within India or within Europe and, and, and be able to do your research because we took the bus a bunch in Europe because we, we found that the different cities we were going between, bus was the cheapest. Train might have been a little bit more expensive and a little bit more comfortable, but bus was cheaper and it got us there in the times we wanted to. So we spent a lot of the time as we were in, if we were hanging in Portugal, we would, we'd would we have a ton of fun at night, get to see the city. But every every day for about two or three hours, we were doing research and using, uh, whether it was the Wi-Fi or our Airbnb or Wi-Fi at cafes, we would have to look ahead and, and do that. But we could do it in a flexible way because we knew we were going to be in Europe for four months, but we didn't know where we were going to be in Europe. So that would be conversations between, between Nikki and I to say, okay, we had friends that went to Bar- or, uh, that went to Madrid. So we're like, okay, let's figure out how, we, how do we get to Madrid at this time? And then we had conversations with other friends and said, hey, we're going to be in Ireland. Are you guys going to be in Ireland at this time? So then we could change our plans a little bit and then meet them in Ireland, if that makes sense. So we were, I guess the focus was saving time uh, I'm sorry, saving money when we could. The other focus was our bucket list. Like, what are the things we really want to do? What are the countries we want, really want to see and, and um, experience? And then how do we build that into the overall itinerary? And as we begin to juggle those, it just came together in a, in a beautiful way. That, that's that's good. You really touched upon one of the things I, I, I was curious about is that effective use of your time. Because you have to have some time to plan, but while you're out there, you do want to experience things and you do want to experience as much as you can in that country or city that you're in. But you really touched upon it there of, you know, the effective use there of, hey, we have to plan this out. Take, let's take a little time now, plan it out so that once that's set, we can now focus on where we're at instead of where we're going. So I wanted to go back, just backtrack just a little bit. to. Go ahead. You know, you had you have a condo in America, and you didn't sell it. Did you rent it? Did, you know, like little things like that. What what did you do to kind of uh, button up or tie up your home life right before you left? That what were some of the things that you had to make sure? I mean, did you fl- did you and Nikki flat out quit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, we did. Okay. So we were both in careers where I was in technology sales for a corporate, uh, a large international company. So I couldn't keep my book of business going as I traveled full time. So I had to leave my company that I'd been with for nine years. Nikki was a clinical pharmacist with a local hospital, a university hospital that she had been with for about five years, I believe, uh, altogether. And she had to leave that as well. So we both had to quit and we had to uh, make sure that we did it the right way to, to keep our not burning bridges and um, just, just leave it all proper. So that was part of the process. And we both knew that ahead of time. And we knew that that was going to be something that we had to do. And then we, as far as the things that, I guess the things that we own and possess, we sold our two cars and we tightened up our condo. We have a pretty minimal condo in Indianapolis. Um, we didn't sell it. We kept it. We love living here. And it's somewhere we've lived now for 15 years. So we, we loved living here. So we just had to tighten it up, get everything in order. 
and pretty much seal it. I had some two uh, great friends in Indianapolis that would come by and check on it. And I had an aunt that stayed for about three months total out of the 27 months. So it was empty most of the time, but because of our homeowners association, we couldn't rent it out. Or if we did, it would have been an extreme uh, headache. So we decided just to keep it empty. And then to be honest, that did hurt our budget. It was something that we were hoping to be able to make some money from um, as we traveled, but it just didn't work out. So that, that ate into our budget because we still had to pay uh, homeowners, I mean, different insurances, you got a, you're still paying the bills at the house and you're, um, you're paying taxes. So those, those things ate into our budget. And then I guess one of the bigger things we did before we left, and uh, I, I could probably post something on this, but Nikki was amazing at cutting down the amount of mail that we had coming to the house and writing to all the different organizations that just want to spam man you in your, in your uh, mailbox. Yeah. So, so we cut, we had a chance. Nikki was about six months ahead of schedule on that. And she just wrote to all these different companies and said, take us off your list. So our mail got reduced considerably, but mail is an issue, especially if you're going, going a long way for a, a long-term travel, because you can only afford it for about six months. So that, that was kind of burdensome in, in the beginning. Um, we had some friends help us out with that, but overall it was, it was kind of a pain. And then uh, I think that was one of the biggest things. And then just getting aligning the finances, aligning how we were going to handle our money abroad and the ease of use of taking out money. I, I've said it before, but Charles Schwab was amazing. That bank and that debit, how that's used is amazing part of international travel because we set that up to have essentially at a very high level, I had three checking accounts just to cover my tail in case things happen. I always wanted to have a minimal amount in each of the checking accounts, a uh, okay. thousand or 2000, but then have savings accounts that could feed into the checking accounts. All um, were with Charles Schwab? No, no, just, just one. Just one was essentially Charles Schwab was our take money out of the ATM in different countries account. So if we landed in Peru or Portugal or Poland or Japan, we could just pull money out of the account using the Charles Schwab in the local currency. And then the coolest thing about Charles Schwab is when you pull that money out, you'll get that three or $4 or whatever the transaction fee is at the time. But at the end of the month, they give you all that money back. So there were months where, um, depending upon how much money we were spending in a certain country, we would get anywhere from 30 to $70 back at the end of every month in transaction fees. So we were never paying transaction fees around the world. And you would think that the currency, that they would make money on the currency change, but that's not the, not the case. They give you great currency exchange rates as well. So, so uh, yeah. if I could just jump in. So I, uh, I use E-Trade as well. So E-Trade does that as well. When we went to Europe, now let me just be clear, they refund ATM fees and transaction fees. Like, Is that what you're saying? Both? Yeah, so we, I never used it as a credit card. I only use it as an ATM card. Okay, okay. And so that's what that's what ours E Trade does that too. Like if you go in and you take cash out, and there's a six dollar fee. It'll charge you that six dollar fee, but then E Trade will refund it to your account. And then also, if you transfer American dollars into the local currency, a lot of companies uh, will charge you that transaction fee for, or you know, the, the exchange rate fee. And also E-Trade does that as well. That's a very good tip, I think. I, I like that. But, and I like yeah. that. That's a great tip on the snail mail because uh, that's something that a lot of people, I, I would say, don't think about. You know, that's yeah. something totally wouldn't they? And then the exchange rates, you're talking $70 a month. It could be more depending on how much you transact. And, and uh, something I'd like to ask, did you use mostly cash or would you have a good credit card that, would, that you would use it in places I mean, how was your spending yeah. controlled that way? So it depended. Um, so the spending control, it was both a pattern of the cash use, like you're describing, and also how we would manage the credit cards. But um, from the credit card aspect, and this is, again, this is, some of this is great before you leave. If you can take advantage of and get some, some, if you're somebody that uses credit cards now, you can switch over and start to look at, Certain credit cards that give you great points back on travel focused. We use on the travel, we use City Prestige and the Chase Reserve cards. Those are great for not only do they give you the priority pass, which I've talked about in great detail, it's that's an amazing pass to get in lounges around the world. Because if you're traveling this way, you might spend a lot of time at airports like we did. And to get access to a, a lounge is fantastic. 
or if you have a particular airline, I, I love United. So to get United points was always good uh, to travel. I know Delta is great around the world. American Airlines has certain places, depending on where you want to go. So be able to use those credit cards and build up points to those credit cards can make your, uh, your usage of points for the major flights effective. But what I did was I, let, I had one credit card that did not come with us on the road. I kept it at home and I used it for a lot of the Airbnb stuff or stuff that I knew that I would never have to break out my credit card just from a security standpoint. So just so you don't have that card on you, because then if you get hacked, then you're going to have to change all your your accommodations and things like that. So I had one credit card that was always going to be at home just from security. And then um, I did bring a couple of other credit cards, but in certain places around the world, we just felt like it wasn't always safe all the time. Some of the places that were safe when, when we're in Japan and Europe, uh, in Australia, New Zealand, we felt very safe. So we used our credit cards openly when we go out to dinner or if we wanted to, uh, if we had to buy groceries or whatever, we would use credit cards in those locations. But other places, we, we laid heavy on cash. And, and another part of the Charles Schwab that I liked was when I, there was a point where I was in a location, I was in Bali, Indonesia. I went on a few blogs and people were talking about their ATMs getting hacked a ton at the local places there. So I worked with, Schwab, I called into their security number and I told them the situation and they, they allowed me to lock it. So I, I essentially would pull out money and I'd, I'd be, so Nick and I would have three, 400 bucks on us at a time, but then I would lock the credit card. So I would know that it was secure because that's one of the scariest things about being on the road is, okay, what if I get hacked and I can't get access to money? So that's why I had, I had multiple ATM cards, but always used the Schwab card because the Schwab card never got hacked. Uh, th- thank goodness. In, in the yeah. over, over two years in a row, that card never got hacked. Our other credit cards did get hacked. So really? Have to, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, it, and it, it happened on that trip twice. But it, before we left, it happened It happened twice in America. So th- those, if you're doing enough transactions online, sooner or later, you're going to get hacked. And, yeah. and, sooner, and if you're doing a lot of, if you have your credit card with you, um, we, we saw it in action and we talked about this on one of the podcasts when we were in, right when we started within the first week of travel, we witnessed a gentleman in a cafe. He was openly hacking credit cards and we saw it with our own time. He, he was sitting on the other side of glass from us and he was, he was writing down 16 digit numbers. He was taking down the information on his computer and he was doing it every time a credit card was pulled out to pay a bill in the restaurant. It's, so he was basically uh, in their Wi-Fi. People would come in and use the Wi-Fi, and that's how he'd probably gain access to their. Well, in this case, well, actually, in this case, he was waiting. So in in Europe and in parts of South America, they bring the credit card device to the table. Hmm. So when you're paying, you pay at the table with your credit card. He was waiting for the credit card to come out, and as it was going into that device, that reader at the table, that's when he was getting the information he needed. Wow. So it was it was a disturbing thing that happened in our first week of travel that we were like, holy cow, we can't pay credit card as much as we want to. Because the, the hope was we could rack up points the whole time we were traveling. But that that kind of set us back to say, okay, let's use cash a lot more. And so we we did that. Um, and so we, we got to Europe. There's places in Europe. And we absolutely used the euro a bunch, but... We paid credit cards in, in Europe and in some of the other countries, but but yeah. So I guess I guess at a very high level, the, you want to be able to cover yourself. So that's why I had multiple accounts with some money in it, and my checking accounts were always kind of low, and then have the savings. So if my Chase savings would feed into my Charles Schwab, so I would just need connectivity to go into the Chase, make a transfer of a couple grand, keep money in the Charles Schwab that I knew that I'd have to pull out and then use that money and then have a secure credit card at home where I was paying for Airbnb flights, things where I wouldn't have to show the credit card, but I could use it and use, use it in that way. That's really good. I mean, that's great advice because those, those details like that can really derail a lot of your plans simply by something you think take for granted here in the United States. And that is it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully you enjoyed that part one of the conversation with Shane. Um, Parts two and three will be coming out in in the coming weeks. Again, this is the stuff I love to talk about. This is somebody that's looking forward, trying to 
fulfill their dream and their goals of traveling um, to open up their mind in other places. Uh, this is exciting stuff to me. And so hopefully you find that there's a lot of value in this and you, you listen into the next couple of episodes as we get into other parts of the conversation on things that they're thinking about or facing. As always, send me notes if this is something that you have interest in and you have other questions that you hope that we answer on this or I need to answer in future episodes. Send those over, um, whether it's email, matt at passportjoy.com or any of the socials that, that, we're, that we're on a great deal. And again, please, like I talked about earlier, send over some good vibes, send over some good comments. Uh, if you want a good laugh, go on the YouTube channel. It's, it's particularly the Tokyo video. You'll see some some funny comments on there where people are just talking trash. If that's just, if you just want to just want to laugh a little bit and see what people are, are making fun of. And um, if you want to get the newsletter, passportjoy.com, put your email address in the box press go i'm gonna send you over some information uh two or three times a month that that we're going through but also travel hacks and tips snag nikki's book and that is it hope life is great wherever you are stay tuned for parts two and three in the coming weeks and um i hope the summer is treating you well and you're going someplace exotic and uh, a lot of fun take care